good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone you're in. Uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful to you for taking time out of your day uh, to be together to uh, uh, discuss this topic. Uh, during the webinar, I'm, I'm going to share with you my synthesis of the priorities and trends um, and directions that I think U.S. research libraries um, are, uh, uh, are taking in the 21st century. Uh, now, these, these, these are based mostly in, on a series of interviews that I conducted with uh, you and your colleagues, uh, the senior staff of many of the OCLC research library partner institutions. Um, when I did those interviews, I promised that if there was some convergence around issues and concerns, that I'd feed that back to the community, particularly to those who gave their time and shared their thoughts with me. Uh, consequently, you're likely to hear a lot that you may already know, uh, but rather than let that make you impatient, I'd, I'd prefer that you take it as evidence that I heard you. Um, I want to tell you what I learned, but first I think it's important to set the current library environment in the U.S. as we see it in OCLC research. Um, the context is certainly shared with libraries outside the U.S., but I believe it's most acutely felt and really generally understood here in the States. Now, I start with the position of the library within the university. Uh, its, its place was determined in the same way that the physical proximity of scarce assets dictated a lot of the built culture in the United States and um, much of our political culture. So, you know, we had the church, the post office, the town hall, and the library all placed around the town square uh, because it was more economical to be close to those things. Uh, it's clear now that uh, those are uh, actually out of place. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the network has changed everything. Uh, it's reconfigured, as we know, whole industries. We've uh, seen what's happened in travel, news, book retailing. Uh, some of those affect us uh, within the library community as well. We also know that the network's the first place for our researchers and our students, uh, and that that's made a huge impact on the university library. Uh, in particular, it's changed the value of the physical book collections and, and the, the actual physical space of the library. And most importantly, I think it's changed the relevance of those library assets and services uh, to the university's output. So we don't actually yet know what it's going to mean to reconfigure the library within the university. Uh, but we do know the context for that new library. Uh, we now more clearly understand the information environment that's shaping expectations, and that's going to be the foundation for the reconfigured library. I characterize that information environment as increasingly flat. Um, by that, I mean that academic collections have become increasingly alike, particularly around the electronic journal literature, but, but also within our traditional print collections. Uh, discovery of relevant information is also flattened. It, it happens outside the library in a small number of large information hubs like Google and the other search engines. Uh, and the actual delivery of the information flows directly to the user's network workspace. So this flattened information environment means that the value of the library is challenged and the library has to be managed differently. Uh, in particular, we can no longer spend large amounts of our budget on traditional operations that are done again and again by every library. We have to redirect our resources to new library services that will renew our value within our university. It's increasingly clear that the physical library is less about the collections it houses and more about providing direct support to our clients and engaging in the research process. Our value is not about the library, it's more and more about the librarian. Now, relatively recently, OCLC conducted a survey to find out uh, how academic libraries were uh, adjusting their priorities, where they were putting energy and effort right now. Now, we did these surveys in a number of countries, and what I'm sharing here highlights uh, four countries, the U.S., the U.K., Germany, and the Netherlands. They're, they're all places where OCLC has a significant presence. 
And here's the top priorities in these four countries. In, in all of them, the number one priority is the challenges of integrating electronic journals and e-books into their collections, uh, managing that electronic information and making it available effectively to their constituents. Uh, the other most frequently mentioned concern was concern about the future of education and the library's role in education. Uh, as you know, the, the, the business and process of education is being disrupted by the web and other technologies in a way that's reshaping education. Uh, the poster child for higher ed disruption is the massive open online course. Uh, there, as well as in other technologies, the library's role is very unclear. Uh, and parenthetically, you may be aware that OCLC Research and the University of Pennsylvania have organized a forum about MOOCs and libraries uh, for uh, uh, March 18th and 19th. And we're going to try and actually focus uh, the discussion there on the library opportunity created by uh, MOOCs. Uh, in any event, the, the OCLC surveys tell us very generally about some shared operational concerns from a, a, a broad base of academic libraries. There were, there were nearly 4,700 of them that participated in, uh, in the survey. Uh, it did tell us what's the top of mind for the important research libraries with whom we work closely. Uh, it did tell us what they thought about the role of libraries and librarians in the future, uh, the kinds of new initiatives that research libraries felt they needed to support, or the collaborations they thought would be important. So it, it doesn't help us uh, as much as we would like in OCLC research, where we're dedicated to helping progress research libraries. Um, we need to determine where we can most usefully invest effort. And for that, I wanted to talk with the OCLC research library partners. So I set out to interview the senior management team at all of the OCLC research library partner institutions. I, I wanted to understand your priorities and directions. Um, my goal was to listen, uh, synthesize what I was hearing. Uh, my method was to find out what issues were top of mind for the management team. Uh, I, I wanted to know what areas were getting your attention right now, what issues were most important for you to address in the near term. Uh, I also want to get people's views on some of the long-term trends and forces that uh, they felt would shape the expectations of the library in the future, uh, that would actually determine what services librarians needed to offer in the long term. The goal was to use what I heard as input to answer the agenda for OCLC research. Um, we should be working in areas that will impact and address these near-term, long-term challenges. Uh, it's also input into setting strategic directions for OCLC. Uh, these are important areas where OCLC needs to be engaged. Now, I haven't interviewed all of the partner institutions. Uh, I've talked to about 70 of them so far. And they, the ones that I interviewed are from across the research spectrum. They're large, comprehensive, private research universities like Cornell or the public equivalent like UCLA. Uh, I've also talked with specialized research libraries who have a mission to support scholarships like uh, the Museum of Modern Art or uh, the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, here's an overview of what I found out. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually part of a spreadsheet that uh, my, my colleagues and I used uh, to categorize what we were hearing. Um, uh, here's another way to look at uh, what I heard. It's a word cloud that's based on all of the notes from those interviews. It, it, it's not as striking as I would have liked. Uh, since people use lots of different words and phrases to refer to the same issue or process uh, over the course of these interviews. Uh, nevertheless, there, there were about 25 things that were mentioned most often. Uh, here's the 25 things that were top of mind. Um, one thing that doesn't appear in this top of mind list is MOOCs. Um, that's almost certainly because I did these interviews in the last half of calendar 2012, and just as the steam from MOOCs was beginning to appear. Uh, at that time, there were six areas that I'd categorize as high concern based on how often they were mentioned. Um, 
special and archival collection, uh, data management, shared print management, staff realignment and development, uh, research support, and space usage. Now, if you look at these based on the number of mentions, you can see that the high concern areas really do stand out from the others. Uh, here's a graph that maybe makes that, uh, uh, that distance and, and relative importance clearer. Now, if you actually look at the areas of medium concern, uh, I think you can see that there are really specific dimensions of one of the high concern areas. So, for instance, uh, digital humanities is, is really one type of research support service. Uh, concerns about technology infrastructure are really a piece of the bigger concern about data management support. Uh, distinctive services is really part of a larger worry about staff realignment and development, um, and so on. So if, if I roll those medium concerns up into the high concern areas that they're part of, the picture becomes quite dramatic. Uh, what it shows is that there's a small set of issues that are really getting the majority of concern and attention in, in research libraries. Uh, the, the concerns change a bit in terms of their rank order, but they're very tightly clustered in there, and they're far ahead of other concerns. Uh, what I want to do now is just look briefly at each of those top six concerns and uh, suggest why I think they're such important issues. Uh, then I'll conclude by suggesting the way these priorities and concerns point to a new conception of the research library in the 21st century. So the number one area for our attention uh, is special collections and archives. Uh, this seems logical. Uh, if the broad information environment has become flat, well, these types of materials represent spikes of local institutional distinction. Uh, they're a means for the library to connect with new forms of scholarship and humanities. Uh, now, it, it could also be that folks I was speaking with knew they were talking to someone from an organization that has a very active set of projects in the special collections arena, so uh, it got mentioned frequently. But, but I think that given that both uh, the Association of Research Libraries here in the States and the Research Libraries UK um, uh, have identified unique collections as areas of strategic focus, I, I think these are genuinely top of mind for research institutions. Uh, the concerns around special collections are that they're not discoverable by uh, those who could make best use of them. Uh, they're either not properly described uh, or indexed in the search engine. Uh, uh, librarians that I talk to are worried about the digitization of these materials. It, it's a big challenge for an individual institution to do digitization at the scale that's necessary to make a critical corpus available. Uh, there's no standard technical infrastructure for managing the materials once they have been digitized. Um, finally, uh, I noted a tension between investing and making an individual institution's special collections useful to the local teaching and research activities um, versus uh, investing to provide support for their use uh, by a global audience. Research support services were the second highest uh, initiative uh, that I noted. And here, uh, the challenge is for the library to become involved directly in the research process by providing expert resources and services. Uh, uh, things that were mentioned included text and data mining, uh, GIS expertise, uh, and virtual research environment support. Uh, there's clearly a need to create a class of liaison libraries that can actively reach out to the faculty and the, the academic department. Uh, these are the libraries with domain knowledge that will work directly with research teams providing information management support as part of projects. The third area uh, is data management. And here, the expectation is that the library will help to manage the products of research, the data that's produced as part of a research effort. Now, some of this 
might be very large scientific data sets, but in other cases it might be personal data collections. Uh, but no matter the size, these are a challenge to be uh, preserved and maintained for reuse. Uh, the library has a big challenge taking on this role because the data storage requirements are uh, often outside of its expertise. Uh, classification and description of data sets is, is different from the skills that have been used and developed to describe print. Uh, and in general, the technical skills necessary for this kind of management aren't often available within the library staff. So overall, data management support provides a very large infrastructure challenge. Um, whether that infrastructure should be created locally or built as part of a national infrastructure is a major question uh, and a concern for the people that I spoke with. Another uh, uh, area for high attention is shared print management. Uh, libraries need to determine how they can rely on centralized shared repositories of printed material instead of continuing to manage all of that locally. Uh, libraries need to incorporate the availability of digital versions of text into their services so they can move print volumes off the shelves. Uh, this means there's going to be difficult decisions about what materials to keep and to discard. Uh, success here is going to require libraries to navigate some major changes in policies uh, to manage some very difficult local politics. Uh, and ultimately to set up new services that have very efficient fulfillment capabilities. Uh, space renovation, uh, another major issue area. Uh, the central library buildings on campuses are expensive and very desirable physical locations. Uh, these spaces need to be repurposed for people, not collections, by turning them into group and collaboration spaces. Uh, to reestablish the library's value, these spaces can be used to create new partnerships with academic departments. Uh, they need to be places that emphasize the librarian, not the library. Finally, I want to talk about the topic of staff realignment and development. To accomplish progress on the other five areas of high concern, it's going to require that library staff have new skills, that jobs be redefined, uh, that appropriate knowledge be acquired, either through training or hiring in these new skills. Now, fortunately, we actually have some data about how this staff realignment is progressing. Uh, Tito Sierra from the MIT libraries did an analysis of hiring during the 2011 calendar year at ARL University Libraries. Uh, he determined that these libraries had 444 unique job vacancies during that year. Uh, more than 80% of the ARL member libraries um, had jobs posted during 2011. He then asked the libraries to characterize each of these job vacancies. He wanted the library to say what was the type of job responsibility and whether or not the job role was new to the organization. And here's what he found out. There were four types of job responsibilities that described almost all the jobs in the sample. They were either a senior leadership job, a department head, or library head, a functional specialist, or a subject specialist. Uh, there were four ways to characterize how new the job role was to the organization. It was an existing job, a redefined job, a brand new job, or it might have fallen into a kind of miscellaneous other category. So what you can see on this chart is that major shifts in positions were happening with department or library head positions where the majority were being redefined or were new. Uh, the really dramatic shift, however, is happening in the functional specialist job, where more than 40% of the jobs were new and another 23% were redefined. This uh, bar chart 
shows the data a little bit more dramatically. You can see how many of the department head and functional specialist jobs were new or redefined. Uh, overall, more than half of all the jobs advertised by ARL University Libraries in 2011 were newly created positions or significantly redefined roles. So the actual job descriptions were also analyzed. Uh, Tito looked at the content of the advertised position, and here's what those job descriptions emphasize. Um, it's a word cloud made from the job descriptions uh, for the positions that defined new roles. Uh, uh, it's hard not to note the increased prominence of digital technology and data in those job descriptions. Um, next slide here actually shows you some of the titles for those new jobs. Uh, here you can see the type of new skills and responsibilities that U.S. research libraries are already beginning to hire, uh, reflected in a few selected job titles. So for new digital jobs, you have things like digital humanities librarian, digital humanities technology consultant, digital records articles. Um, for new technology jobs, you have director of scholarly, scholarly technology, uh, innovation, user technology library, uh, and, 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 and we have the, the new data jobs, uh, e-science jobs, uh, data curation library, e-science library, etc. Uh, so you think about uh, the hiring and about how it relates to the major concerns that uh, research librarians discussed with me uh, during the interviews. Uh, what we're seeing is that hiring is beginning to happen to support the changes in the library service portfolio. Uh, managers are redefining jobs. They're redirecting the position. Uh, they're trying to build up a capacity within library staff to offer these new sets of services. Uh, they're beginning to build what will become the 21st century research library. Now, that said, I think a, a little perspective uh, is, is also in order. Uh, if you look at the total redefined or new jobs, it's, it's more than half. Uh, but, but consider those 233 positions across the total ARL staffing. Um, you have to wonder whether it's enough change and fast enough change. Um, uh, that's a replacement rate. Uh, amongst the professional staff of about uh, nine-tenths of one percent per year. Um, it, it's, it's also clear to us that, it, that we don't have a century uh, in, which to, uh, in which to change the skill sets and, and redirect them at, at new services. Now, this is certainly uh, an overstatement. I mean, the, the actual rate of change is, is certainly much higher than this would suggest. Um, because this, this, of course, only represents new and replacement hiring. We know that there's a significant repositioning of existing positions going on. People are being given new skills and new assignments. Um, but, but we don't actually have any way to quantify uh, that, uh, uh, that, that change, uh, and it's, it, it's relatively invisible to an analysis like this. So I, I would contend that we, we are beginning to build what will become the 21st century research library. Uh, we're redirecting staff at those major areas that will represent a new portfolio of services for the future research library. Uh, uh, my colleague, Wendy Rouget, the director of the University of Minnesota Libraries, gave a very good presentation uh, not so long ago at an ARL membership meeting in which she said that research libraries are moving towards a, a new set of customs, a new set of rules, uh, both for their own uh, institutional behaviors as well as their behaviors as a, as a, as a group. Uh, she called it uh, a new rubric, uh, a kind of general prescription for the future. Uh, in this case, what she's prescribing is the shape of the future library. She believes that the 21st century library is going to align itself closely to the local priorities of the institution. It'll manage some local infrastructure, uh, and it'll provide services that respond uh, and leverage the unique institutional assets 
which includes areas of local research or teaching of distinction. Uh, that local alignment, however, is going to be supported by collective goals and priorities that are understood by the community of research libraries. These, these local operations are going to depend on shared infrastructure, like potentially data management and preservation facilities, uh, and on shared assets, um, like print collections that are jointly owned and accessible by many institutions. Uh, uh, this kind of alignment of the local with the collective shared structures is going to uh, define the 21st century library. Uh, the, the priorities, the trends, the directions that uh, were reflected back to me from uh, research libraries represent changes in organization, uh, in infrastructure, and, and in metrics. Uh, the, the new 21st century library organization is going to be defined by shared collections, um, cooperative governance, uh, and disclosure of library assets on the web at the network level. Uh, that new library and its services are going to be supported by an infrastructure of collaboration spaces. Uh, joint ownership and stewardship of assets that are used by all research libraries um, and by cloud-based management services. That library is going to have to be assessed in a different way and, and in the future uh, will be assessed based on support for the research process, um, by support for the management of the institution's intellectual property, uh, and by the impact uh, that all has on the local teaching, learning, and research outcomes. Now, what I see is that the research library with this organization, this infrastructure, these metrics, uh, will actually renew its value to the university that funds it, uh, to the campus community that relies on it for services, um, and to the broader society that benefits from the knowledge it's helping to create. Uh, I, I think this is the road of reinvention uh, that uh, that we're currently being uh, that's currently being built. Uh, if the 21st century library uh, that is going to be the result of the current priorities and trends that uh, that people are, are are now investing in. That's the, uh, uh, that's the view from the interviews that I've had with, uh, with those of you so far. I appreciate your time. I'm glad for the attention. And I'd, I'd be happy to have your uh, reactions. Uh, be glad to answer any of your questions. Uh, I'm also uh, interested to have your thoughts about where OCLC Research is investing its efforts and where it should be directing energy. So I'm going to open this to general discussion of, uh, of the synthesis I just provided. Uh, and then I can uh, share with you uh, the current alignment of research effort with the kinds of priorities and trends that, 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 we, just, uh, uh, that we just outlined. Uh, so, Jim, this is uh, Marilee Prophet here in San Mateo. I've been uh, watching the Twitter feed here, and there's a, just a couple of questions, um, actually kind of a couple of comments from uh, Steve Bell at Temple University. And uh, the first is um, about your comment about the research library future not being so much about librarians. And uh, he was hoping that you'd elaborate on that. Uh, sure. Th yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks for uh, getting on Twitter uh, as we were going along. So uh, what, what I would hear from um, uh, people when I talk to them is uh, uh, a real urgency associated with uh, finding their value 
around services to the local community. Um, and, and certainly collections are one of those services. Uh, but given, you know, given the ways in which uh, the, the information source can be delivered in the various uh, places from which it can come, uh, what, what I'm seeing and hearing is, is people trying to uh, align themselves around the, uh, uh, the, an emphasis on the service. And as you can see from some of what people said, said back to me, uh, that the way they're defining uh, services is, is very, I mean, at a high level, has some uh, similarities, but, but at a local level, has, is, 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 is very distinctive. So, you know, for instance, support for the research process. Um, you know, some people have taken the path of, uh, you know, converting and reskilling uh, uh, their bibliographers to be liaison libraries in particular departments. Others have said, uh, no, we're going to have a central uh, resource uh, that, that's going to fulfill that role. They're, 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 they're building the actual delivery of those services in different ways that are peculiar to their, uh, you know, to their campus environment. Uh, but the emphasis is on services rather than, uh, than on the physical collection asset. Uh, Jim? Jim? Yes. This, this is Nancy Gwynn. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we, we can all hear you, Nancy. Okay. Um, I was wondering to what extent the uh, uh, slowness of pace in staffing uh, changes is coupled, if it is, with um, libraries losing staff just because of the budget concerns and um, certain programs going away? That's a good, it's a good question. And um, you know, one of the things I, I asked people was, uh, uh, well, what I actually asked them was, tell me the title of the last uh, three or four positions that you uh, filled. Um, and uh, I also asked them about their financial and budget situation. What was really interesting to me was uh, that I expected a lot, a, a, a lot of the, the budget uh, uh, pressures to spill over into uh, we can't hire, we can't, uh, uh, we have to keep vacancies, we can't get new positions. It, it, it was not, uh, that was not actually the, the case at most places. Uh, most of the folks with whom I spoke were, in fact, uh, able to fill positions, uh, and they were, uh, when they became vacant, and they were using the, the vacancy as an opportunity to redefine and, and hire in new or different kinds of uh, skill sets. Uh, the people who weren't doing any kind of hiring, almost everybody either was thinking about or had begun a process of uh, uh, new training, new skill acquisition opportunities for, uh, you know, for the existing library uh, staff. So I, I didn't get the impression that, that the rate of change around staffing was being driven by budget constraints. So we have another question uh, from the chat. Can you elaborate on how research libraries can move towards greater collaboration? And that comes with an observation that many institutions are um, still uh, – Feeling the need for ownership or act for, for ownership over over uh, projects and services. Yeah, I I, I mean, there's, I think the dynamic here is is isn't uh, new. I mean, I think we've in our community we've always struggled with that dissonance between uh, 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 seeing efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, uh, at, at a collaborative level, but uh, having uh, local policies, perspectives, uh, politics, uh, you know, get in the way of embracing that. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think it's going to happen all at once. Um, uh, one of the things that we're seeing and is uh, uh, 
a readiness and a willingness to collaborate in a much more meaningful, um, substantive way at a regional level, at um, uh, in some of the uh, within some of the existing consortium, uh, and, and I think uh, part of uh, part of that is uh, if you think about the, what, what we've talked about in research and, and has been a favorite theme of Lurkins, uh, you know that. We're, we're sorting things out between what needs to happen at the local level, what should happen at the regional level, what should happen at the, the you know, the national global network level. Um, and, uh, and I, I, what I'm seeing is people becoming comfortable in maybe moving, you know, up one stair, uh, rather than jumping multiple stairs. Um, and so, uh, so I think where we're going to see some of the, this movement first is, is from the local to the you know, regional or consortial um, for, for particular things. Uh, and the physical collection of sharing, I think, uh, may in fact occur at that level first. Uh, things like uh, data management infrastructure, uh, you know, things where we don't already have extant uh, investments and in local capabilities. Those are ones where I think we're going to find it um, uh, uh, easier and uh, to, to move uh, to the higher level, to a national or global scale. Uh, Jim, we've had a request to move back to the previous slide, if you would just do that, for those in the viewing audience. Um, and while people are gazing upon that, there was um, another question, again, from uh, Stephen Bell at Temple. Uh, from earlier in the uh, presentation, uh, observing that he was interested that user studies came out so low on the interest scale of library directors that you spoke with, um, and uh, because he thinks that it's important to understand what the users are doing so that we can improve what we're doing for them. Yeah, no, fair, uh, a fair point, Stephen, and, and, and I'm, I'm glad you noticed it. And, I wouldn't characterize it as uh, uh, not important. Um, uh, remember, what, what I was, uh, what I was the, asking the directors and the management teams that, that were in these discussions was, what's, what's top of mind for you? What, what, what's getting your energy and attention? What, what represents a priority? Um, and in that context, I think you know, it, it, it's not. Uh, a surprise to me that, that user studies didn't get mentioned. User studies, I think, are you know are crucial enablers um, to actually determine the uh, you know the appropriate kind of local services um, and and institutional uh, uh, priorities, but or, or profiles, I should say, of services. Um, so. Uh, so I don't think user studies um, is, is unimportant so much as uh, it just wasn't the, the arena that was going to get significant attention uh, from the administrative level uh, when I was talking with them. Uh, so there's a lot of good comments uh, coming in on chat. So if uh, people want to kind of read through that, you can see there's some kind of good back and forth and commentary there. Rather than read through all of those, I'll uh, go to another question. Um, does OCLC know how many of the functional specialist positions require an MLS versus another sort of professional degree? Uh, I don't know the I, I don't know the, the details, um, but what I can tell you uh, is that uh, Tito's uh, work, which, which uh, I think we'll, we'll, when we post this presentation, we'll post the proper link directly to his uh, to his study. Uh, but he did he did look at that, and uh, and it was about half and half, uh, and uh, which actually was a surprise to me. Uh, I thought it was going to be lower than that, uh, but there continue to be uh, uh, you know a significant number of ARL level institutions who. Uh, are making uh, traditional uh, library or information school degrees a uh, requirement for these new positions. Okay, 
Okay. I don't see any uh, new questions, so either type them in or do as Nancy did and go ahead and unmute yourself or let us know that you need to be unmuted and we can do it for you. Hi, hi Jim. This is Stephen Bell. Hi, Stephen. Uh, you know, I think it's kind of interesting that we just heard today a little bit more about what the Obama administration is thinking with respect to how they might change accreditation standards, particularly with respect to uh, governmental funding for higher education in the United States, and emphasizing much more uh, student learning, student outcomes, and so on. So if we're research institutions, and we might see some drastic change in the funding we get if we aren't showing how we're graduating students and uh, demonstrating their academic success. Is it possible that we would see a decline in our research funding and therefore should we, in fact, change some of our priorities so that we are focusing more on student learning and student outcomes and a little bit less in some of these other areas if, in fact, our institutional funding may be affected by these new standards that might be coming out? Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a good observation, and I would generalize it. Uh, a, 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 lot, a lot of the discussions that, uh, that I had uh, were much more sensitive to and attuned to the, the teaching functions at the local institution. Uh, people were uh, people recognized that they needed to make some direct connection between the library assets, the library services, the investment in the library, and student outcomes. Now, I, I, I think that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I, I think it is doable, um, but, but, but people are now genuinely paying attention to that. The other thing that I was really heartened to hear and I think this goes along with, uh, with your observation about the, the shift in the general landscape. Uh, university administrators are aware of this as well, and many of the people I talked to uh, explained that their university uh, had uh, taken significant steps to, um, you know, for outreach into their local community, the, the public universities in particular, uh, you know, were emphasizing uh, uh, that they needed to show uh, local value delivered uh, within their geographic community as well as uh, the more traditional kinds of university success criteria. So you saw some libraries saying, ah, that's become a university priority. Community engagement has become, uh, you know, a mission-level kind of, uh, of goal. I know how I can help with that, and, and you saw, uh, and, and I saw libraries, you know, performing that kind of community outreach and engagement function uh, because they saw how it was related to the university's success criteria. So I think you can see a lot more of that kind of uh, uh, attempt to directly connect library activities to these uh, uh, locally articulated uh, university success criteria. Okay, thanks for your answer, Jim, and, and maybe that will be part of the metrics in the future that we're collecting. To be, I hope so. So we have a couple of questions uh, on the chat. Rita Vine from University of Toronto asks, you, uh, or says, you mentioned that the number one issue in U.S. libraries is the future of education and the library's role. But some key activities like curriculum integration rank low on your list of priorities from your interviewees. Can you explain this further? Well, I, I think again, uh, uh, these were these were discussions, uh, and I was and, and I was encouraging sort of open-ended uh, conversation around uh, around the topic. Uh, so, so unlike a, a, a you know properly structured. Uh, sociological study uh, where we would have used the same you know, appropriate vocabulary throughout, um, you know, we, we got people talking in, in the terms that were closest and most important to them. Uh, you know, I think, I think curriculum integration, you know, 
actually represent, or, you know, an emphasis on integration into the curriculum represents the same kind of general instinct about the need to, um, uh, to connect with student outcomes, uh, make a difference to that dimension of, uh, of the university's uh, success. So uh, I, it's just that I think a smaller number of people uh, uh, at that moment were emphasizing curriculum integration as opposed to uh, uh, as opposed to it not being uh, important. Um, another question from chat. Magda El Shabini asks. How are the electronic content providers playing a role in this arena? Many research libraries are currently loading massive numbers of e-content individually. How will this work on a global level? Uh, well, I think the big, uh, I, I think the, the, the big open question is really around e-books as opposed to the electronic journal literature. Uh, I mean, I, I think our patterns have been established relative to uh, to the uh, journal literature. Uh, what we've got in the in the ebook arena, uh, you know, both monographs and textbooks, is uh, is, is a, a, a publisher a set of publisher business models that are in full churn, and you know. Aren't going to settle down, I think, for uh, for uh, for some time. And in that environment, I think libraries uh, are are having to play a very reactive, uh, very nimble kind of role in order to uh, bring those materials to their uh, to their constituents. So I I think um, uh, some of the lessons that we learned in uh, interacting with uh, the publishers of electronic journal literature. We should build on that in uh, trying to influence the, the ways in which the ebook business models and, and, and licensing relationships uh, uh, develop. And another question from Nancy Gwynn. Are we planning to develop, publish, slash publish useful, slash successful examples from OCLC research partners? of projects or programs that illustrate the characteristics of 21st century librarians, sort of like a modeling exercise. And then Scott Walters echoes case studies that illustrate these trends, good idea. Uh, uh, Nancy and, and Scott, yeah, thanks for the, for the comment. I, I think that uh, we've talked about uh, doing exactly that and, you know, to use the, you know, use the phrase that, that Scott made, uh, 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 made part of the community vocabulary, uh, distinctive services uh, need to be uh, captured and, uh, and reflected back so that uh, people within the community can learn from one another. And again, I think uh, uh, at, a, at a high level, uh, the, the framework and the, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the general criteria for those kinds of services can get articulated, I think the implementation of them is going to be local and distinctive. So uh, in that sense, I think case studies that uh, uh, separate the, uh, the, the general from the, the specific implementation will be particularly useful. Um, here's a question on metadata. Do you see it from Stephen Hearn? Do you see an ongoing role for librarians in metadata creation, management, and enhancement? Boy, that's a that, that's a difficult question. I I, I think that um, you have to make some assumptions about the ways in which uh, uh, metadata uh, is going to evolve, uh, and you know we're part of some of those conversations. But but uh, you know our view in research is that uh, descriptive uh, metadata uh, is going to uh, uh, be. It's going to disappear uh, into uh, basically uh, establishing the relationships of a particular information object with other information objects. Um, so, so you you can see the beginnings of this in uh, the attempts, well, both in BigFrame and, and in other uh, uh, other metadata uh, arenas, linked data experiments. Uh, where what we're really talking about is is associating the, the thing in hand and establishing
establishing authoritative relationships with other things. Uh, so I think you can see a future for librarians as, uh, as, as the authoritative connectors, the authoritative creators of those relationships. And, and I think that's going to be the kind of evolution of, uh, of, of our metadata contribution. I think we probably have time for one or two more questions if someone wants to be brave and unmute themselves. Can you hear me? Indeed. Okay, this is Scott Walter. <coughs> I guess, <coughs> excuse me. Um, a couple of questions that, that come back to me, and again, it's, uh, they're not to be answered, but I think that can be explored further, is, well, two things, I guess, that have come out uh, as, as you've been talking. One is this question that has been rolling around in my head for years now, which is what is the appropriate, or what is the expected, not appropriate, what is the expected bundle of services? I think for many years we had a fairly good shared sense of what the expected bundle of services one would find if one were to go to a research library, faculty member, student, or what have you. And we built those human resources around that expected bundle of services. Um, and we had a sense that that bundle of services was somehow different uh, in some ways uh, than what you found in other sorts of academic libraries. And all of your data you just reinforces what I've seen on the ground, which is that there is not currently a, a good communal sense of what the expected bundle is. Uh, it's very distinct. It's very emergent. And it's popping up in different ways in different places at different times, which makes it, again, a very interesting time to take a snapshot. Um, so I'll leave it at that. So I think that's what you really captured is that we don't really know. We have all these new positions. We're not exactly sure what they are. And we're not exactly sure which of them we really need to have. Uh, in order to meet some of these goals that you've noted, which is, you know, that's the fun part. Uh, uh, ditto to that, Scott. I think your 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 take is exactly uh, the same as mine. I mean, we're beginning to see some convergence that you can articulate at a high level. The way in which that that uh, the contours of that. Uh, the specific contours of, 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 of those uh, services at a local level are going to be very different, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, we're still far from a shared set of, uh, of expectations. Uh, like I say, that's, that's what makes this, uh, I, I think, a, a particularly interesting inflection point. And that, that echoes a, a question that we had earlier on Twitter uh, asking for you to talk a little bit about metric specifics for the 21st century attributes, and again, probably too early to develop those. Uh, well, I think one of the things that will characterize them, however, uh, because of the, uh, because I think you're going to get hyper local sorts of dimensions to the library service uh, portfolio, uh, is that you, we're, we're going to be much better at uh, at measuring. Uh, satisfaction and impact uh, uh, in the way that in, in ways that we can learn from uh, some of our uh, commercial and retail uh, uh, entities. Uh, so I think I think the, I don't know what the metrics will be, but 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 I, I'm almost certain they're going to include a, you know much greater emphasis on uh, on on satisfaction. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot for us to learn from the uh, consumer arena where these expectations are getting set. I think that's probably about it. So we'll turn it back over to Melissa to wrap us up. And thanks again to everyone. We'll be posting, uh, and, and I'll make sure that some of the links to, uh, uh, to the sources that that I use are uh, posted along with the uh, presentation. Thanks again for your time.